Um, hello, my name is Joe Crossley from Astral Project. Um, I have been uh, uh, developing ideas and working around uh, new future technologies and discovering uh, digital technologies from spaces, uh, sacred spaces uh, in Egypt. So the talk I'm going to give to you today is what we've found and how we're applying this to our work. Mm -hmm. Through on the cursors. Yeah. 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 So, famous fame thing, you want to find the secret of the universe. Just to say we're filming, yeah. you might want to stand nearer. Yeah, yeah. Just, just click through there, is it? Yeah, let's yeah. click through there. Yeah. Uh, obviously, this is part of our works. Uh, Intention Astral Project is my production company. Uh, we work in future digital art technologies and how we apply them to the human experience. And um, in that, we've done a lot of work with things like Burning Man, uh, Glastonbury Festival, and uh, a lot of other different installations, Sydney Opera House, working with Samsung and Intel on how we apply their leading edge technologies to uh, immersive media arts. Um, on this project, our aims for uh, going through into the King's Chamber was uh, to look at the Hertz frequencies found in uh, in the chamber itself and to uh, collect data on the existence uh, of this, uh, these resonant Hertz frequencies in the temples and their potential use. Um, we want to look to how we can apply these frequencies to design and biomedical and biophysics and then also as well immersive media arts. Um, we're trying to fix the echo, yeah. yeah. Or, or make it stronger. Oh, right. Does it do Sound off on that computer. Let's do it again. Plug in the headphones. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, so outside of the obviously immersive media arts, we're looking at different um, uh, uses for these frequencies on biomedical and um, uh, physics, biophysics. Um, and then, uh, we also are looking to create a library of these uh, sound frequencies and also to understand uh, if there is any commonality between different sacred sites around the planet and uh, how we can how we can start to unlock some of these um, these, these uh, details. Um, so where we look so far, um, ultimately, we've been in Egypt for the past five years. Uh, we've been going into the Pyramid of Giza and um, closing down the Pyramid of Giza uh, for a period of like two or three hours and uh, conducting a, a choir audio uh, at the King's Chamber. Um, the reason why we looked at the King's the Pyramid of Giza specifically was to do with, the, with um, a collection of reasons specifically to do with its design um, on its location, um, and within the structure itself, there are multiple layers of significance in modern science. Obviously, I think maybe some of you have heard some of the work that Graham Hancock's done on this and, um, and other sort of leading scientists, but it, it's a profound structure. Uh, its dimensions, its orientation, its position on the planet uh, have uh, an incredible amount of layers of detail with regards to its, its uh, design and what that uh, relates to in its position on the planet and even the planet itself. Um, so we started to look at this because we, fi we figured that actually this could be a location that could have other layers of data within the structure that we have we have yet to uh, to uncover. Um, specifically, we looked at the King's Chamber, which is a chamber in the centre of the G Pyramids of Giza, Pyramid of Giza, and the King's Chamber, as you can see, is orientated like this. Um, it's a it's a vast stone chamber built out of uh, these rose granite um, slabs. And on top of it is collections of beams that are also made of, of, of rose granite as well, going up to stack uh, in, in, in a layer of about five, five uh, different layers. These, uh, the ceiling is actually interestingly made of these beams, and each of the beams is toned. If you hit the beam with a hammer, it would create a resonant frequency that is the same across all the beams. So for us today to even emulate that sort of architecture or design process in a slab of granite, 500 ton slab of granite, uh, uh, rose granite, is just mind-blowingly uh, accurate and uh, even cutting the granite to that shape. So this was one of the most interesting spaces in the world for us to look at resonance. And so we went in there and we took a, um, a collection of singers into there and we started to work on um, a process to extract uh, resonant frequencies and watch those res resonant frequencies change. 
Um, but it's one of the most interesting and important and myth mythical structures on the planet um, for this practice. Um, even though I don't believe it was used or built for singing uh, at all, I just think we, we, we've got the ability to go in there and sing and, and, and explore uh, resonant frequencies using our voices as it's pretty much the easiest way. Uh, obviously, it's a hard place to get hold of to close this place down uh, uh, with the Egyptian Department of Antiquities is obviously surrounded with politics. And uh, we had the, we've had we've managed to do that over the course of, uh, of five years, uh, three times. So um, we've got quite a lot of data on that. Um, um, so what we did was we went into the Pyramid of Giza with uh, a choir, twenty-person choir, and we sat in the Pyramid of inside the King's Chamber, and we toned using our voices based upon the resonant frequency in the King's Chamber for the period of about one hour and twenty minutes. Uh, the reason why the time is really important, uh, not specifically for the number, but we found that uh, in the first recording that um, the resonant frequencies, much like a crystal bowl or when you run your finger around a glass, the resonant frequency starts to develop. The granite in the room starts to oscillate itself wow. at ultra high frequencies. Um, so even into the inaudible range, uh, you know, going up above 15 uh, kilohertz, 20 kilohertz, going off into that sort of range where we can no longer hear it, but dogs can obviously hear it, hear this, hear this sound. Um, and if we're using a 20 person choir, we've got a circle of people. And the interesting thing that we found with using your voice is that when you're singing in a resonant experience, when a resonant chamber, that frequency is impacting the air in your lungs. Right. And it's creating a bio, like a feedback loop, much the same way as you've got a microphone going up to a speaker. It creates a feedback loop, which therefore that resonance starts to impact and create multiple layers of feedback upon your own voice. And therefore the frequency starts to develop. And ultimately, as well, the resonant of the, the resonation, the resonant sounds of the room start to provide these really, really ultra high glass like crystal frequencies that you start to hear. Um, which you'll have the experience to experience tomorrow. Um, obviously, resonance uh, as 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 a, a resonance transmissibility uh, as as it as a science and understanding this is uh, sound doesn't diminish when it's in a resonant environment. So, meaning that that sound frequency will start to grow and grow and expand and expand over the course of time and uh, all other sound frequencies outside of that diminish and that's why you have a resonant you know you're standing in your bathroom for example singing and you hit that perfect tone and everything starts vibrating it's basically the same the same theory as that that we're, that we're looking at specifically um, and the most interesting part of that is once that starts to happen that bio that feedback loop between your own lungs and your own voice starts to take place and uh, and crazy, well, we don't want to say the swear word, but crazy things start to happen. Um, <laughs> these granite slabs, we can start to hear them on the actual audio recording, vibrating at ultra high frequency. So, you know, 1.5 to 10, 10 kilohertz uh, uh, starts to appear. Now, that's nothing to do with your own voice. That's nothing to do with the resonance of the chamber. That's something else starting to vibrate. Uh, ultimately, it's the, the rose granite. And I can imagine trying to make a piece of rose granite vibrate using your voice, uh, you know, intensely uh, hard experience. But once you create that resonant frequency, the power of that resonance starts to build. And that's what starts to make these 500 ton beams of granite above the king's chamber start to oscillate. And if you can imagine the next layer above that, that's os os oscillating higher and higher and higher frequencies as they start to move up. So this is a, a, a quality of the chamber that we've started to really look at and record. And as you can see here from the EQ, you know, um, at, the, at, the beginning of, at the beginning of the sort of the practice, this is sort of the vocal range of the human voice. And as we start to get into these higher frequencies, these are the sort of glass-like sounds and the higher, higher glass-like sounds. And they start to create these patterns that then start to diminish as you go right up through the, uh, the frequency we're in. That's sort of 10 kilohertz. So look at the, you know, you can see the spikes that are coming in there on, on, on the EQ range, which is very much crystal bowl sounds, like a high sort of crystal ball resonant sound. Um, and this was instantaneous. This was from our first recording. And we, we realized that, okay, these chambers are providing us from our own voices, from the input sound that we're providing to it, a collection of other uh, data and sound data that is starting to appear and grow and develop as the resonant, uh, I call it warmth or heat, but as the resonance starts to build 
um, these 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 other these other stuff, uh, patterns start to arrive, and this is the stuff that we're really really interested in. Uh, what, what those patterns are, and the, the notes and the frequencies of those patterns, what they can be used for and applied for in in, in, um, in uh, modern technology or even experiential technology. Um, so yeah, it obviously takes time for these to appear. Um, we also start to look at other sites around Egypt. Um, we, uh, we've been on tours up and down the different temples and Carla and myself as well. We've been uh, exploring a collection of, of different locations. We found these, uh, what I call sound boxes for want of a better word. Um, now, these are really, really interesting chambers that are located outside the temples. Uh, and they are, they are boxes effectively They're around head height and when you put your head into each one of these boxes and make a make a resonant sound, first you get a resonant sound from the box itself, but the sound actually is completely connected to this box. So the sound frequency passes between and creates uh, a, 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 a group cohesive effect. Now, theories about why they were used or what they were used for are, are, are you know speculative, but we can see that the same technology that we experienced in the Saqqara. Uh, tomb and the Temple of Karnak, thousands of kilometers away, uh, the Temple of Bile also as well, all contain these same boxes. You've got to go and find them and look for them. And um, when you measure the distance between the chambers and the walls and also over the top, these granite slabs are existing as well that are, pro are providing that same technique. What were they doing? Why were they using it? And what effect did it have? on the people that were um, that were using it and also experiencing the sound. And interestingly enough, Colin and I went in there and we were sounding in one of these chambers, weren't we? And instantaneously, the uh, the guards turned up with their guns and kicked us out. Yeah, so it was like they, they, they fully knew what we were, we were up to. Uh, uh, but that sort of me, you know, piques your interest a bit more yeah. once you actually get into that. Yeah, so just to, just to tell you how I got involved in this project. So... Um, Tom Middleton, who's the third party in this uh, project, he came around my house uh, thanks to his manager, Rami, and uh, I played him some ungoogleable <laughs> library records. And, uh, and because of that, he called me about a week later and said, Carl, do you want to come in the King's Chamber and do some sound experiments? So I thank God for my record collection that I got. Uh, <laughs> my real interest in all of this is uh, having, having a history of 3D modeling and reconstructing ancient buildings around the world. Uh, this was, as uh, Joe mentioned, this was our first sort of uh, mm. point of call on the uh, on the map um, of the last tour, and this was the the new ISIS temple. And we went in these in these side flanking and immediately started toning into these boxes. And immediately the the authorities were clamping down on us because that sound went directly into the main temple through these boxes. So that, <laughs> yeah, we realised that it was like a projection device that was coming up through this chamber, mm. coming out through one of the walls of the temple, mm -hmm. passing through a courtyard. And then down into another uh, a ceremonial room deep within the temple building, right? And the temple of Philae also, as well, interestingly enough, has been reconstructed. It was moved when the when the Nassau Dam was built, um, and it was lifted onto a different island. So it's been reconstructed. So it's imperfect, but still has that, that uh, interesting quality. Just in terms of my background, this is a model at Cistercian Abbey uh, made about twenty years ago now. But this was Musian, it is a partner, but. Yeah, my real fascination, I've done a TEDx Oxford talk on this, um, is the effects that 3D modeling had on my, my real world ability. So my peripheral vision, because I was making these massive 3D structures, mostly reconstructing from, from the ground up. What was fascinating, it was, um, yeah, in, improved my ability to drive. I could see further down the road. Um, it affected my dreams. It was affecting all sorts of, um, of abilities and uh, check out the TEDx talk for more detail on that. But um, there's lots of projects now looking at these reverse engineering, the acoustics from these 3D models. So Unreal Mega Scans, for instance, if you're not familiar with those, they actually are capturing the, the archaeoacoustics of these buildings and then you're able to reverse engineer and, and sort of listen to these uh, effects. As Joe said, we're very privileged to be able to go to Egypt and not get inside the King's Chamber and let alone get to hire it. So the ability to do these experiments from your from the comfort of your, of your home is what we're really interested in. And as Joe said, we're trying to create protocols where we can really explore these frequencies. And the, the fact that these frequencies seem to match up in different uh, locations. Also, another reference we published at World Alchemy Journal, uh, a lot of this work. So yeah, I think that's me. Go back to Joe.
Yeah. So, I mean, to go back to the sandbox, it's inter inter interesting that the results obviously be yet to become affirmed because uh, we get, keep getting threatened with being arrested <laughs> when we approach those sites. But um, Egyptian temples and the people who work there are gradually becoming more open to understanding this. And the dogma um, that I, I think they think and, and the D Egyptian Department of Antiquities are starting to understand that sound and the use of sound in Egypt is prevalent, even to do with stuff that we don't understand at the moment, but for even industrial purposes. So, um, yeah, we haven't got the results from the sound boxes properly yet. We've got little bits and bobs, but nothing really enough to dive into. Um, so then the question pops up, like, why actually are these chambers resonating to these frequencies why are we finding this data what were they being used for and so we started to look a uh, collection of different potential use cases and um we started uh testing the the basically the application of these free frequencies and we found some really really interesting data um which i'm going to present to you right now um on 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 some potential uh, effects Rather than trying to theorize on what it was, we we're actually going right down to actually, you know, um, uh, uh, cause and effect. And um, so, so we're looking at the harmonic harmonic resonance technologies and um, and their purpose within these sacred sites. And uh, what we did was we basically created a protocol uh, of looking at harmonic resonance and uh, its effect on the biological and physiological effects on the human condition. Um, we had a variety of different opportunities to look at EEG uh, data collection, heart rate monitoring, uh, even questionnaires and personal experience. Um, but we settled in on this test that we're doing with uh, one of my company's resonance Residence.us, uh, which is looking at um, extracting data from vocal toning with uh, the experience of vocal toning in a resonant ex resonant space. So your the sound is hitting your body, the sound is affecting your lungs. It's creating that feedback loop. And when we start looking at this uh, data for heart rate variability, so heart rate variability is. Um, uh, a really simple uh, physiological phenomenon that we witness in wild animals. Uh, effectively, it's the difference between the space between your heartbeats. High heart rate, by heart rate variability has uh, indicates health and well-being. Uh, you're relaxed. You're in a you're in a calm, happy, connected state. Low heart rate, rate variability, as in the the space between the time of your heartbeats, is all the same. Um, is uh, a clear sign of morbidity as well. So. Here we have, here we have a, a nice little test that we can look at uh, based upon the speed at which your heartbeat is um, beating, um, which effectively you're not really in control with. It's, it's something coming from your brain, a signal that's coming from your brain was triggering those. So we started a test where we were doing a control. Uh, the left is the control. That is a 10 minute meditation on your own in silence. Uh, and uh, and then the one on the right is uh, uh, you uh, toning, uh, in a resonant meditation to uh, an experienced sound input from a resonant experience. So you can start to see that there's a complete different correlation in the data uh, between the two. Um, obviously, the left is uh, is, is uh, messy, and, and this, 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 coherent, this is sort of a coherence graph which shows you that um, this is uh, up to six. You can't really see the detail in here, but this is very low coherence. And then we start to see through, uh, we've tested about 180 people so far, and um, we're seeing very, very similar patterns appearing across those, those experiences. So we're measuring people's uh, human experience to the subjective tone of resonance and also singing along with it, uh, using your, your voice to do that. Um, Again, you can see the difference between the patterns quite clearly uh, and the data at the bottom, this, this extraction of data uh, shows that there are very low coher heart, heart rate coherence, but once you actually get into, um, into singing and, and vocal toning with this, um, the the data is 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 uh, is visibly different. There's nothing different really in these two chambers, the uh, two experiences. The people are sitting on a chair, they're meditating, they're breathing. The difference with this on the right is that they are experiencing a sound uh, that's being played to them and they are focal toning back. So they're matching that sound with their own voice and toning back to it. Um, and so for us, this was uh, a moment of realization that we can actually measure the physiological effects of, of, uh, of toning on, uh, uh, in, 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 in a pure data form rather than personal form. So uh, the heart rate variability curves um, 
grew to be greater. We've got from 67 to 330%, 13% increase in heart coherence score, uh, which comes from the Heart Math Institute, um, from a 20-minute 20, 20 resonant meditation and a 50% increase in peak heart coherence score. So that's the peaks. They're reaching higher levels of heart coherence. So um, it's proving to show dramatic shifts also in the percentage of time, uh, the meditation that they're in a state of heart coherence. So this has great implications for physical experience, our experiences, bringing people into states of connectedness. Uh, even, you know, when we're at music concerts or stuff like that, people singing along choirs, it starts to show the physiological effects of that and uh, and how that can uh, uh, improve your life or create different different. So we're interested in the, the, the use of, of this in products and and how we can effectively bring people into a more relaxed state so uh, the next sessions uh that we've got uh we are looking at this in different locations around the world chichen itza and uh places in malta and uh looking to record the hertz frequencies from those sites and then apply them to different use cases uh, and also the one well, of the main sort of aims of this is to build up a library of resonant frequencies and the keys around around those sites and look for commonality. Look to try to find the same patches and codes of those frequencies and see if they relate to each other uh, and, uh, and then put them to use. And we're going to have a practical session tomorrow here where we're going to be playing the actual audio recording of the choir that we had in the King's Chamber. And we're going to go through the process, if you'd like to join us, to actually sing and experience that. Um, we won't be rigging people up to heart rate monitors. Don't worry about that. <laughs> but we will ask you what your experience was and, and, and try to collect some, collect some feedback from you on that. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We certainly have time for questions. A very quick observation, Chaz, Chaz Rod, you took. Um, one, 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 just a second, sorry. One, one thing I, it reminds me of, um, seeing both Carl's uh, 3D modeling of buildings, the sort of measurements you've done. I went to the uh, Arab um, Sound Lab some years ago, and Arab, Arab can actually model entire spaces acoustically and actually do it with um, a speaker array that allows you to model that. Yeah. Bearing in mind the difficulty in getting to some of these buildings and the attitude of the antiquities uh, people in Egypt, mm -hmm. is there some um, mileage in actually doing some reconstructions, which though imperfect, might start to sort of give you a sense of the, you know, to do it virtually to some degree. Mm. Obviously, it wouldn't give you the full sort of sense of the building, but could, how much could you do virtually? How much do you have to do in the field? Well, um, with, with, with the programs like Unreal Engine, for example, mm. we can emulate spatial audio uh, resonance. So, for example, you walk into a church, you can hear the, 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 the reverberation of your voice in that church. Mm. However, to reconstruct the King's Chamber, there is no company on the planet today, right now, who are literally able to undertake that task. It's 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 practically you need, impossible. Of granite. <laughs> well, you need to be able to move five hundred ton slabs of granite, you know, which uh, there are multiple cranes would be needed at the same time. You know, I think the largest cranes that we've got are sort of one hundred and twenty tons. So you'd need four of those working at the same time. But it might be an interesting project, even just to see whether the space, you know, the physical properties are clearly important, but the virtual space might be an interesting one. Yeah. To yeah. So we've actually also got a second project, which is a cloud-based program oh. that is uh, creating these virtual spaces online. Right. And uh, we're actually launching that in two weeks called astral.io. And so we are creating uh, automate, the cloud automation technology mm -hmm. that allows these uh, spaces to be uploaded and deployed on the click of a button, so from a web browser. Mm -hmm. um, and that's coming out. And that's part of that is really, really connected to the ability to be able to provide those experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, the infrastructure is what we have to work on to make that possible um but yeah we, we're lucky enough to be able to have cracked that and we've got that coming in two weeks so uh for example king's chamber sacred spaces uh churches mm. uh, other environments even touristic experiences and virtual experiences yeah, basically you answered my question because you know the meetings on cathedrals yeah enter them on and then the 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 resonance is the experience of course yeah and so you have those and then the concert hall usually mess that up <laughs> yeah they do because they want to have architecture over functionality but i mean churches i mean there's conspiratorial stuff to do with the retuning of you know the organs to full yeah, sure. and uh yeah. you know there's there's a whole lot of uh, literature based on that but if you look at you know 
um, some of the ancient medieval cathedrals, even the window patterns emulate the cymatic patterns from the resonant frequencies from those chambers. So you, you can start to understand that they had a very, very clear and detailed understanding of not just the frequency that they were, they were trying to look for, um, but what the patterns they created because the stained glass windows form those patterns. Mm -hmm. um, even right back to, you know, some of the Stone Age temples in Wales, uh, I was lucky enough, my parents have a bed and breakfast in Wales, and we had an American scientist turn up and he was playing a low D, which is the bottom of the male voice. Uh, inside some of these stone temples, and he found that um, the, the, the stones, these giant stones were constructed to resonate a low D, right? Massive stones that were used to resonate low D, and actually he found dust rising off the floor in columns. Uh, uh, alongside the carvings on the entrance chamber walls because they thought the spirits were rising up out of the ground. Um, so they were using uh, vocal sound resonance in these chambers in you know, pre-medieval times. Question for Carolina, yeah. First of all, thank you so much. Really, really interesting, really interesting work that you're doing in terms of sound and space and especially connectedness. So that's what my question's about. You mentioned a lot of research regarding coherence, especially from the Heart Math Institute. When you were doing these experiments and when you were doing, uh, when you were measuring all of this, did you notice any kind of synchronicity or coherence happening between the members of the choir that were singing? And if so, what were the effects that you found just um, yeah, from, from the group that was partaking in these? Yeah, so from the testing aspect, we've been doing it individually. Um, we haven't actually done a group test uh, as in everyone doing it at the same time. Um, but when we were actually vocal toning inside the King's Chamber, the profound effects that people were experiencing, not just from that event, but from weeks and months after that. Um, people had out-of-body experiences. Uh, people were having very, very intense dreams, uh, personal synchronicities, also emotional stuff that was coming out. People were experiencing uh, emotional trauma releases. Uh, that were quite challenging for them at the time and actually processing that stuff as well. So um, that's purely just verbal data. You know, it's not scientific data, but we were, you know, people would be coming back with us year on year to, to go back in to, to see the next step. And for me personally, uh, it's been a profound, a profound journey to just to, uh, you know, it's opening Pandora's box, right? You're opening up this, 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 uh, this experience that, you're just using your voice and it's common for every single person in the world singing right using your voice together to sing how how does that affect you not just physiologically but emotionally and your personal development i think we're opening up to a whole range of new things on that front right i'm sorry we can't take any more questions we've got to run to the next paper so i think we'll wait for the break thank yeah. you once again no, thank pleasure. you, thank you. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Carmen Jill Vrolik. So, Carmen, uh, if you'd like to um, present from now, thank you. She's on nice. my Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Hey, Carmen. Hi, everyone. Feel free to override the share, Carmen. So, just uh, yeah, share your presentation uh, with us. Okay. Well, so hi again. This time I am in Paris. I'm so sad I can't be there with you, but I'm flying uh, tomorrow to Johannesburg. So I, I have enough time to, to do everything and, and, and be there today. Well, so um, as I presented a bit on, on Tuesday on my other presentation, um, today I'm going to talk about Voltaje, which is this art and technology salon that we created. We called it Salon because we really thought it would, it would be interesting to have uh, that conception of something that is uh, like, a, like, like an exhibition place where you can gather different artworks that represent a moment or, or a reflection in time. Um, I work at Universidad de los Andes in Bogotá. This is our last edition at the Planetarium. We have been around for nine years. This year is our 10th anniversary, as I was telling you. And I told you a bit, our university started this program uh, of art and technology at the beginning of the 90s. And by the end of the 90s, uh, I was graduated from that program too. It dealt with fine arts and performing arts and, and, and media arts. And um, there was not uh, an exhibition space or exhibition um, uh, event for art and technology. There, there were a couple of initiatives, mainly from the French embassy, from the British council, from the Goethe Institute, all coming from the global north, of course, where everything was happening. 
Of course, uh, France and, and, and the UK have been uh, very strong into digital arts and technologies in Germany as well, since the, I think since the 70s or, or 60s. Um, but as, as an art form that, that was um, close to, to the audience, to, to the public, it was difficult to find galleries. So um, a couple of years, flash forward in 2013, one of my students, ex-students, Juan Ricardo Rincón, Juan Rincón, he's an architect, he started talking to these people that had this uh, textile factory in the industrial zone of Bogota, which is not something remarkable. And there was like a, a reorganization of the territorial plan of the city that required that all buildings that were uh, built uh, aside the law, had to be reused or repurposed for other um, events like uh, cultural or um, maybe some events that would have some impact on the on the locality. So he uh, he talked to the owners of this building and he said, "I think we can make a, a cultural center here." They were very skeptical at the beginning because this is the industrial zone. There is no, this is not in the center of the city. This is not in the northern part of the city. Everything happens in the center, in the northern part of Bogota. But this is the industrial area. So he came up with a plan and he redesigned the building, uh, keeping the, the textile uh, factory structure, but redesigning the facade. And, and he created this kind of uh, skin and this terrace. And this is uh, how Textura was, was born. We were allowed to work here for five years. Then it was rented to a call center that, that usually made profit. We didn't, of course. And <laughs> we got kicked out uh, of, of that beautiful place. But we started here for five years. We worked here. And, and every time there was uh, some intervention that we would do inside the, inside the factory, um, rethinking the way uh, machines and technology and, and the audience could uh, inhabit this space for a couple of days. Our exhibition only runs for three days. It's very difficult, it's very expensive to, to produce art and technology events because you have to rent equipment, you have to find artists, you have to uh, rent many things, you have to construct, you have to produce, uh, you have to upscale some projects and, and it's, not, it's not profitable. Uh, the second, the, the subtitle of this conference is art as an experience, not as an, not as an object, because that's what we try to do. We try to create this, these spaces. This is the second place that we uh, moved uh, into. This is the, an, uh, an abandoned hospital that is called San Juan de Dios. It's a hospital that was built in the 1500s. Then it had some other buildings built in the 1700s, 1900s. And we uh, actually, Voltaje was at the nunnery. And this was built in the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. It was abandoned. And some people said it's haunted. Well, uh, we saw strange things, but we don't know if, if it was because of the projections or what, but it was it was a fun place to work in inside. So this is the, the other part of the building, very French architecture, of course, and this is the outside of the building. So each time we, we worked here for two years, um, in the middle, there was the pandemic. So we were we were supposed to work in another building that is called the Bronx, which is an old uh, military um, quartel. And uh, what we did when the pandemic hit is that we developed a 3D model of the site and we commissioned site specific, like virtual site specific works for, for this uh, space. Um, we always try to, to talk to technology and, and to listen to technology and to listen to the artists. So this year, that was our, our pandemic year. We didn't want to do a virtual gallery like everyone was doing, like having events online, but actually to create something meaningful. And we created this, uh, this navigable space and, and the works were commissioned for the, for the model of the site. It was very interesting. We also had performances that year online. This is part of my work, the, of a little bit of hybrids, what I uh, showed on Tuesday. And we also had some people developing amazing performances, like this is from uh, Nine Volts, Nueve Voltios, which is a duet from Colombia. They designed this um, performance space called Domosphere, and it was streamed live at the, it was um, October, 2020. We also worked a lot with uh, Instagram filters that year with artists that, that, that would do Instagram filters. So we tried to take, to take everything that was happening on the pandemic, through the pandemic, and, and, and try to um, 
I don't know, create a space where, where you could see what was happening at the moment. Um, so a little bit about, the, and this is the planetarium. This is where we were last year. This is our third location. This is Bogota's planetarium. It's a beautiful building built in the 50s. And uh, this is where we will be having our 10th edition this year too. Okay, so a little bit of history and a, and a little reflection. We um, are an international art exhibit featuring a wide scope of artists from established as well as young and upcoming. We have had big names, uh, famous people, and we also have uh, recently graduated students or people that are going through the university. We don't have a curatorial theme of subject usually because I'm not a curator, I'm an artist. And sometimes I think that curators bring, uh, of course, a lot of interesting things. Of course, there is a need of, talk, of talking about different subjects, but sometimes artists get pushed or feel obliged to work in a certain subject or area because it's what the curator is asking for. So we actually keep our ears and our eyes open and, and every year we look at a lot of different uh, art from all around the world and we try to give it a meaning and we try to convey all these artworks under, under an umbrella, but it's not, not like a curatorial subject. Last year, since we partnered up with the Planetarium, they had another a parallel event that dealt on AI, on posthumanism, on the future of the world and climate crisis. So that was the first year that we like sort of had a curatorial theme. It's focused on artists and creators, uh, not academics, because actually uh, there are a lot of spaces for academics and, and conferences such as this one. But we actually tried to create a space for artists to show their work. And then we, we didn't have enough time and, and everyone is asking us, why don't you have a conference? Why don't you bring people to, to study these artworks and to reference them for future um, studies or research, and we want to do it, but we don't have enough uh, enough time or money to to do it so far. We have conferences, artist talks, workshops, and guided guided tours on site, and also streaming. So these are a couple of images. Um, we are under the protection uh, of a huge event that is called the Million Pesos Art Fair. This is the way we have been working for ten years. This event wouldn't be possible without them. The Million Pesos Art Fair is it will be like the 200 quid million uh, 200 quid fair art fair, and it's a uh, it's a fair that gives um, place for young artists or artists that don't have a gallery or actual representation to sell their work for around 200 quid. So it's a huge, it's a massive event that gets a lot of funding from uh, private enterprises from. Uh, different um, uh, uh, organizations. And we are the Universidad de los Andes, uh, Fundación Telefónica also funds our projects. And we have a lot of support from the French embassy, the Spanish embassy, and the government of the city of Bogota. Of course, we don't produce money. We create a space where people can come and interact. These are a couple of artists that have been present in Voltaje for, for the last couple of years. We work with robotics, live and expanded cinema, high tech versus low tech. I was telling you on Tuesday that we are a country that doesn't produce technology. We recycle, we reuse, we take what we can. That happens in, across the global south. So we have to be very creative sometimes. And we find also artists that are creative and are reusing technology. We are into interactive art performance, in, um, in interactive installations, data, and other forms of, of visualization sound art, new architectures, et cetera, name it. If it's there, we will showcase it in any way. We don't show many video, like single channel video, because that's like another different area. Some of our subjects, of course, politics, gender, memory and death, uh, reuse, obsolescence, nature, abstraction, science. And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. Robotics, this is Juan Melo. He's an artist from Cali, Colombia. Um, he developed this uh, line of robots that are called Technologicus Precarius, which of course are very precarious, but that's the interesting thing. He said he always wanted to, when he was a kid, he wanted to be an astronaut and go to NASA. And he said, well, uh, build robotics. And he said, I can do it with, with whatever I have around. So he built this kind of robots that have very distinctive personalities and that have to move around, taking care of those plants that are on top of them. So they search for light and, and he builds like an environment for them. 
But of course, we have had uh, other kinds of robots. This is Mariela Yeregui from Argentina. This is called um, like uh, Alert States. And these are two robots that when feel threatened by people, they produce some kind of uh, small aggression like um, throwing up a graphite or a jiggling or there these are like funny robots uh, but we also have had uh, for example like uh, robotic arms like this uh, enormous structure that was uh, sent by SIARC which is the Southern California Institute for Architecture in Los Angeles and it was an, a robotic arm that would try to draw landscapes and you know, he was in this uh, sort of enclosement and he was uh, always drawing but but he was licking the painting because it, it's not his job to to travel to to, to draw landscapes uh, we also have had for example patrick Tresset, which is french and he makes this uh, amazing machines uh, like uh, like portrait robots or portraitist robots this is called paul is an artist that draws your uh, your portrait in 30 minutes or so and you have to sit and, and pose there for half an hour and he's going to draw your portrait and at the end he signs the the, the portrait that he makes it, it's an interesting reflection on authorship and time and the image of course we also have had interactive installations many of them this is a uh, fala by rajane cantoni and, and leonardo crescenti from brazil it's a beautiful installation where you get to talk on a microphone and you can say a word in any in any language. If you say love, for example, all these old cell phones would uh, speak and talk back to you in different languages, telling you uh, what love is and how is it said in, in other different languages. Um, this is Laura Colmenares. She's a Colombian artist living in Belgica, in Belgium. She, she works a lot with water, fracking, uh, compositing, and, uh, and, and matte painting. And she makes these installations where you can interact with the image as well. And uh, we always, uh, this, this work was not, it was partly commissioned, partly produced in Bogota. Of course, our budgets are not as far as uh, the budgets here in Europe, but we try to produce with what we have locally, which is a lot of resourceful people and also a lot of old equipment we, that we use to put to work as well. We have had many artists from France too, because of the support of the French embassy, of course. And, but we also have people, this is a physicist, she's called Angela Pardo. She works with um, analog, analogic technologies. And this is some, some of the things we like to do. We like to create spaces for all technologies and new technologies to, to come along together. This is Andres De Negri, an Argentinian artist. He works a lot with old projectors that are um, uh, hacked in order to burn film. And to he creates like these giant loops with um, pipes and film that are also screens. And he talks about uh, politics and power in Argentina and the regimes and, and all of that. Um, and these are many installations. This is uh, Carlos Abadini from Colombia. It's uh, it's her family album, and it's on a thermoreactive paper. And when the when the table cools down, you get to see the picture. When it hits up, uh, they all disappear. So it's called um, Recordatio. It's about memory. And we also have people working with sound art. We also have people working with uh, interactive installations that are available for the audience to interact with. We also have had a lot of scientists coming uh, to work with us. This is Jean Machnomas. He's the um, director of the, Inst the La Institute of uh, Research for uh, the Dynamic of Fluids in L'Ecole Polytechnique here in Paris. And he has, uh, he has created amazing installations uh, from the scientific point of view too. So pretty much we have had everything, expanded cinema, installations, um, uh, uh, many, many different uh, approaches to what art and technology could be. So I'm gonna show you a bit. This is uh, Alba Triana. She's an amazing Colombian artist. She just won one of the prizes at the Arts Electronica in Linz. And this is uh, work done by some physicists, physicists also um, in Colombia. And well, this is, uh, there's, there are a couple of pictures uh, this is Liam Young, for example, which is an architect um, slash filmmaker. Um, he, this is a film completely done with 3D scanners. No cameras were involved. So we tried to create a, like an installation to showcase the process and, and the work. We also have, as I told you, activities, workshops where all the uh, young uh, students can interact with the artists. We have conferences. 
And uh, we also have a program with, with public schools, people that don't, uh, I mean, in, in Colombia, you have the public and the private um, education and the public education is very scarce and it's a uh, very challenge. So we always have a program for public schools to come and talk to the artists and we give them workshops and we try to uh, give them an approach to what technology is. So we are into that kind of uh, space that we're trying to create and to, to create access around this area that is sometimes a niche area for academics and for people that work in the arts, design, technology, engineering, that, that kind of, uh, of a very close uh, space. So I'm going to finish with what we did last year, which was at the planetarium. These are a couple of images. We also had to do some sessions like audiovisual sessions uh, VJ DJ sessions. This is um, Alex Roger, for example. This is uh, Nono Tak, very famous also. And we do guided tours and visits on site as well as online. To close this presentation, I'm going to show you the, the last uh, uh, year exhibition at the Planetarium. This is the Dome of the Planetarium. It's one of the largest in South America. We had the exhibition. Now we built a garden. It was a different space because um, every year we were used to have like a special space for one artist. And what we did last year is that uh, we had the huge dome, we had the whole planetarium, but we didn't have as, as much space as we did before. So we built a garden. We built a garden with a scenographer that I used to work with since I, I work in theater. I called my friend scenographer and I told him, we need to build a garden. And we built a garden, and this is the, the first year that we featured um, single channel videos because it was an interesting way to, 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 like, to create an, uh, an ambience or an atmosphere for everything. Like this garden where you would have all these artworks that would reflect on AI, the end of the world, the post-human condition, um, other technologies, and... Uh, it was an amazing place. This is an AI work, for example. Just, just, just say, we, 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 need, we need to wrap up shortly, if that's okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, say, uh, I, stay, I see that I have a minute left, so I'm going to wrap it up. Okay. So this is, <laughs> for example, um, this is an AI work that was done in the Amazon River by uh, Alvaro Rodriguez, which is a Colombian artist. He, he built uh, a special system where you could see something that is called the flying rivers. It's, this is a, a huge current that goes through the Amazon and that we cannot see, but it can be represent, re represented with data. So this, this is uh, Marcos K from the UK, actually. He's an, he's an artist that is based in London. And uh, this is uh, these are some views from the garden. And we also had, um, uh, this is um, a machine that would draw Martian landscapes in real time uh, with raspberries connected to, to NASA satellites. And uh, these are the kids from the public schools looking at the, um, at the drawings of Mars. And this is a little bit of, of what we did last year. And I'm going to finish with uh, some uh, stills of the performances that we had at the planetarium. This is the space before the garden and of course, we did everything we could to make it work. And this is what we did in the dome. We had projections and we had live sessions, like people playing live music and projecting huge uh, images, wonderful images in the dome. So um, the our open call is open. Uh, it's uh, voltaje.co, that's the address. If you look for us on the, on also on Instagram, you will find Voltaje. Uh, can, you, can you put that into the chat so that we have yeah. that address? Sure, sure. sure. Yeah. I will write on them. So we are open for a month. And if you know any artists or performers or people that would like to come, please let us know. And thank you for your time. I mean, that's a, a fantastic series of events. I mean, I think to have that sort of picture of what's going on at the moment in Mexico is, fun, is wonderful. Well, um, and, and Colombia. I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the first one I saw, I saw was that's right. So it was Colombia and, and, and the full dome, of course. Um, so if anyone does, uh, you know, sort of want to apply to that, um, the link will be there in the chat. It would be excellent. We've got time for literally one question, if anyone has a question for Carmen. Indeed. No? OK. So once again, thank you so much. And uh, our next speaker, please. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we have who's here we are. All the power. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Avar Santana. So, uh, Charles, uh, if you uh, are ready. Uh, yes, um, I will just uh, share uh, my screen. Try to share my screen if you zoom. Just a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, are you seeing uh, my my screen? Is it good? Yes, it's good. Yeah. No? Okay. okay, great. So thank you very much. Um, um, it's a pleasure to be uh, here with you. We would like to be uh, in present, mm -hmm. but uh, we are now in Marseille, uh, south of France. So uh, we will talk today about spectral music and um, one of its um, main um, techniques of composition. To begin with, um, I would like to uh, make a little recap uh, of what is uh, the French spectral school. Uh, spectral music uh, was a term uh, coined by Hugues Dufour, which is a uh, philosopher and composer, and um, it uh, designates a uh, compositional attitude uh, combining, combining science, technology, and music. Um, the group of uh, French composers uh, called uh, as Spectral, um, they were students of uh, Olivier Messiaen, the great uh, 20th century uh, French composer, at the Paris Conservatory around the 1970s. And uh, the main idea of these composers, those composers, sorry, was to introduce uh, perception into composition. Um, uh, they tried to oppose the widespread influence of serial music that was uh, very strong since the 50s. Um, the aesthetic uh, implications of serial music were seen at the time whether rightly or wrongly, as an excessive obsession with uh, structure and uh, the system in itself, disregarding uh, the act actual sound or perception, or the musical perception. So those composers try to uh, bring back music uh, to, uh, to uh, the listening experience. Uh, the key pioneers of uh, spectral music in general um, composers like Horacio Radulescu, a Roman composer, uh, James Tenney, an American composer, and uh, Jean-Claude Risset, another French composer. Uh, James Tenney and Jean-Claude Risset worked together at Bell Labs uh, in the United States. And um, uh, those French composers on the Olivier Messiaen classes at the Paris Conservatory, they founded a uh, musical ensemble uh, the Ensemble Litinéraire in 1973. The main composers of this, uh, this group are Gérard Lisée, Tristan Murray, Hugo Dufour, Michael Levinas, Roger Tessier. They are all alive, apart, aside from Gérard Lisée, and the Ensemble Litinéraire is, it is still a um, very active uh, group in French music today. So music history um, commonly assigns these composers with at least four significant principles, principles which are closely interconnected. The first one is the fusion between harmony and timbre. Um, these integrations, this integration creates a sense of ambiguity. Uh, they blur the boundaries of uh, traditional categories of uh, musical theory and then blend with uh, concepts derived from the physics of sound and technological models influ influenced by ele electronic music. The second concept is the concept of um, technomorphism that includes the instrumental synthesis, the technique we will talk uh, about today. Uh, hopefully speaking, it's the um, translation of uh, techniques from electronic music to instrumental music, to music made with uh, acoustical instruments. There is also the notion of uh, liminal music, which was the term uh, Gérard Lillet, this uh, composer we will look into today, uh, preferred. So uh, the idea of liminal music is a music that explores percept perceptual threshold effects, playing with the boundaries of our perception, and pushing the limits of what we can hear or interpret in sound. 
And uh, finally, um, last principle, it is uh, the idea of uh, continuous uh, transformation and processes. Spectral music, it's a very slow music that needs time to develop. And uh, they try to integrate perception in the music by making the processes audible. So I will give uh, the speech to um, Javier, which will talk about mm -hmm. uh, technomorphism. Yes, hello, everybody. So I want to speak about technomorphism. So uh, among the writing techniques of the spectral school, which refer to the concept of control technomorphism, we have the use of different techniques as instrumental filtering, spectral rationing, and spectral exploration. For example, in the piece Desintegration of the Compose from the Composer Tristan Morail, he used different spectral music techniques that are related to the use of the filters. We can speak, for instance, about the spectral rationing, which could be related to a bandpass filter. Or, on the other hand, he used the filtering of different pitches thus reforcing certain parcels of the spectral series. Or spectral exploration allowing melodic movements with the spectrum. We can find another kind of technomorphism, for example, in the instrumental use of the numerical effects, such as delay and reverberation. In his composition Color for Orchestra, Marc-André Dalbavi, use different electronic effects from electronic music using a symphonic orchestra. For instance, the impression of reverberation is created by the use of an accent and a game of dynamics. He also is, uh, he will be also able to realize different types of effects by playing different kind of attack resonance. For example, a pure impact with a resonance, an attack with control resonance, or the use of low sounds. Can be also find in this work other effects of electronic origin, such a combination of impacts equivalent to a delay, or the treatment of sound masses with the same position equivalent to an harmonizer. Another kind of technomorphism technique used by spectral composers, and is also a kind of uh, very particular, a very characteristic of spectral school, is the remodulation. This technique can be used with the real electronic modulators or a theoretical model for writing harmonies, timbres, and spectra. For morale, harmony and timbre are the same thing. They are two facets of the same phenomenon. And the remodulation was a sample way of creating in a, in a, in harmonic spectra. Working with the flutist, uh, for example, Moel realized that if you play C sharp and using A sharp, you get two resulting frequencies, the additive and the subtractive. By doing this, we create an inharmonic in spectrum that we can calculate precisely. As, as for the rest of instruments, we can even take the same notes of harmonic of those notes. And we can change this note and to start a new harmonic progression. This technique can allow us to create new harmonic progression and new types of orchestration. For example, you can see an example of the notes of the pitches of the processes of ring modulation. In this example, the pitch A is in 40. 400, 440 hertz and is remodulated with a sine wave tone of 200 hertz. The output will be 640 and 240. And the mural for the piece, for the piece match 25 for two on smart note and orchestra. For example, he used the own smart note instrument itself as a very precise generator. And he's using the orchestration and the harmony for this music in different layers. First level, with the use of fundamentals provided with this uh, uh, remodulation. The second level of remodulation, use of the harmonics. And finally, the modeling lines with the smart notes and accompanying it by symphonic orchestra. In canon. These techniques enable Gerard Dissé and Murail to create another type of core that will be had never created before. What interests Murail and Grisey was creating a new grammar and synthesis 
for using this kind of course. It raises a related question, the question of inharmonicity and harmonicity. And the whole range of these two parameters can create in one composition. Now, uh, I would like to introduce you the concept of instrumental synthesis more precisely. So instrumental synthesis um, tries to achieve uh, many goals, but one of which is simulating the additive synthesis using orchestral resources. Additive synthesis was the main um, synthesis technique in electronic synthesizers uh, in the past. Uh, it involves um, combining a group of basic waveforms following a particular amplitude envelope and the frequency relationships. And the outcome is um, a synthesized sound where the perception of the individual compo components, components give, gives way to a um, unified, fully integrated uh, timbre. In the case of the instrumental synthesis, the pure electronic waves are replaced by the sounds of the orchestral instruments. And uh, unlike, unlike uh, electronic waves, the instrumental sounds have already the all own unique timbre, which makes them resistant to complete, completely uh, fusion. So the distinctive sonority of uh, instrumental synthesis was viewed by composers of the French Spectral School as a novel listening experience. These sounds were seen as a hybrid between, between harmony and timbre, creating a sonority that while not entirely blended um, sound, uh, they were no more a, um, a traditional uh, chord. So there are many um, works by uh, Gerard Grisé that use um, this technique. Uh, the most well-known examples are period, partiel, but there, there is also modulation. And when, the, when Grisé wrote the, those works, uh, it, he had a, um, um, son sonogram, a image of the sound that he tried to orchestrate. So in modulation, modulation uh, he had the sonograms of uh, Bryce instrument. In the case of Transitoire, another piece for uh, orchestra, large orchestra, he had a, a sonogram of a low string from the double bass. There is also Licone Paradoxal, a piece based on recordings of uh, speakings of the name of Piero della Francesca, a um, Italian painting, painter, and um, some of his texts. And many other composers of this, this school used this technique of instrumental synthesis, like uh, Tristan Mohai, uh, which Javier just uh, um, gave uh, some examples, but also Marc André Dablavi and Jonathan Avi a great English uh, composer. So just one uh, quote from Tristan Uhai to give you an idea what he thinks of uh, instrumental synthesis. The orchestra often acts like a big synthesizer. It builds complex sounds by adding instrumental components. The resulting chords are often so, bl so blended that they will be perceived more as timbres than as harmonies. So I will give a quick demonstration of the instrumental synthesis. Uh, the technique is more or less based on the harmonic series, which I will um, present right now. That, that is uh, microtonal. We can't play really exactly with a traditional piano. Um, here is an example of a spectre from the piece uh, Derive from Gerard Grisier. So the idea is that uh, like a chord, but it's more blended than a simple chord. And this spectre is consisted of the 12 tones of the chromatic scale, but we don't hear the 12 tones. They are so blended that we uh, hear a unique sound. So here's a demonstration of uh, this, these 12 sounds. So 
So uh, we have a approximation with uh, microtones in the harmonic series. In the example more well known, it's. Create this spectrum, uh, we analyzed the sound of a trombone and uh, try to orchestrate its uh, internal components using. The most important piece we would say that use the technique is partial, a piece from uh, 75. Uh, it's part of a cycle, Les Espaces Acoustiques, which uh, are composed of six uh, pieces. Um, the main part of the piece, the, the start of the piece, is a trajectory from harmonicity to inharmonicity. I will finish the presentation. I will try to uh, speed up, giving uh, an example uh, of the beginning of this composition. Sadly, we don't have uh, much time to hear uh, more of the piece, but we have been developing an analysis and creating um, some symbolical descriptor, descriptors to um, help us understand the composition. One of them is the density of passages for uh, bisection. Um, it has a uh, arc form uh, like this uh, character of the composition. I'm sorry. Um, just a, a second. We have me also tried to develop a, a big set of uh, descriptors to understand this um, this uh, composition. One of them is how uh, Gerard Grisé used this instrument of orchestra to uh, uh, bring to life certain partials of uh, the harmonic spectrum. And um, to conclude, uh, we would like to uh, help bridge the gap uh, between um, traditional musicology, which we think uh, don't have the tools to analyze this kind of composition. And we would like to bring uh, computational tools uh, integrating sino processing, experimental science, science in the practice of musicology. And we envisage uh, several types of uh, spin off uh, in the fields of acoustic design and sonification, and uh, develop, developing um, new strategies to um, um, validate uh, by uh, listening tests um, our analysis of uh, this technique. And also issues surrounding non-verbal communication, the sensory uh, substitution based on sound as medium. And we would like, um, by uh, analyzing um, uh, instrumental synthesis, understanding better the process of acoustic fusion and the boundaries of fusion and the links between uh, sound texture and tension. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions, Jean? Oh, indeed. So, uh, once again, thank you. And um, now, uh, head off to lunch. And <laughs> just to say, our keynote speaker begins at one forty. So, you've got until then to uh, enjoy lunchtime. Thank you all. And, uh, good session. Thank you.
Questions. And then it doesn't be a And then they changed the timetable. So there was a lot of training. I didn't get home until like well, and then I sort of made so some. I know you've got a few. I think I've got a few. Well, the first one. I think it's a bunch of stuff. 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 I think it's a bunch so how you start it? Okay. Is it just control yeah, yeah, absolutely. So when you yeah. using yeah. 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 So I was just oh, here we go. Now it's up. So I was just yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Speakers all saying different <laughs> versions of C from different. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. No, it's just, yeah. you know, it, we spend so much time. You, you just, the concern is that it doesn't go. Or I can just get back on like another rich. Uh, and then it's not working. Yeah, it's I think it's a good thing. 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 It's a Check it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That should work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I get rid of, I get rid of the old one. No, external, external. Uh, 
Richard Wright, somebody is getting to be a Really noise, really Then, whenever you go to share, you can just go straight there. So that's sound. Focus on the story. Okay. Because otherwise, the front there all the people will be here. So it becomes interference. I see. Okay. All right. I'll get rid of that one. Get rid of it completely. Yeah. And you know, we're happy to check. It's really, you know, I'm going to be off the gear. I guess every work I've done. I guess the thing I had in advance who was the the old one. The other work I've done. Do you want to have a look and talk? As a musician, I work with a lot, but you we know, just do things separately, mm -hmm. and then we just find that as it works, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've, 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 we've only done. Yeah, no you guys will stop. Yeah, of course. We're not. We're not gonna lose our base. No more. Steve, no, he's done music. I've done visual. And then sometimes, you know, it I might be because we're on mute yeah. right now. Yeah. I think this yeah. audio was yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Well, I was like, <laughs> 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 I didn't expect that. That's cool. I think we can. Then when you actually see results, right? Which is what you want to say. We're going to have to communicate, I guess, so that people. No, yeah, I guess I've been sort of you know, exploring a number of different, I guess, things. Right, 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 right,